so we know pretty much scientifically that a relationship, it's like two years where it's like that dopamine phase that where a lot of them break off after that ends. Christians get married in like a year. <laughs> so you're going, you're, you're deciding a lifelong decision when you're in the dopamine stage. Mm-hmm. And there's really no way around it. We need to talk about the third person in the room, which is God, yeah. Jesus. So would that work in a uh, secular circumstance? I would say probably less. Mm-hmm. If both of them believe and love the Lord and have an active relationship that constitutes reading the Bible together, praying together, reading the literature, having fellowship with others, I would say it would work very well. Cool. <laughs> All right, it's boogie, guys. Let's get it going. All right. All right. Prayer. Let's start in with our prayer. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together, for helping us figure out some little tech problems, for giving Mike the insight to deal with them, and uh, giving us great equipment that we're still learning how to use. We pray for a great conversation that you will guide our words and our speech and our focus uh, so we can edify those who listen. And help us bring some new thoughts into this domain, uh, thoughts that are going to encourage principle and uh, growth in these young men and and women so we can see things as they truly are. Thank you, Lord, again for this wonderful Labor Day holiday, and we pray safety for all those out there as they're coming or leaving home uh, on the roads and, and wherever they are, Lord. We pray for safety among them. Thank you, Jesus, in your awesome name. Amen. So this is kind of a part two to uh, something we filmed last week when we had some technical difficulties. We uh, one of the po- uh, one of the video feeds is blurry, so we're going to kind of recap and at least give a quick overview of it's what from we all went that through. intensity, man. I know. Got so I don't know how that happened. The camera was like, oh, can't take um, it. But we're, it out. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we all watched this debate between Rolo, um, the writer of the Rational Mail, and Ruslan, who is a Christian. I guess you could just say influencer. <laughs> um, it's kind of mostly on marriage and relationships because um, Rolo, that's kind of his topic and his book is mostly about that. And so we we watched it. We have some critiques on kind of both their viewpoints and have some clips we're going to go through and just give our thoughts on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sounds yeah. good. Yeah, it was fun last time. We had a ton of fun. Yep, and Phil we got, what, like halfway through? Yeah. And, yeah, so this is going to be cool. I've had a little time to marinate on some of these things because it was very fast-paced. So we're going to do a quick recap, right? Starting yeah. from the beginning. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Let's do it. Before we start this clip, uh, the context of what was going on before this was they were talking about marriage, and Ruslan is kind of calling out how the red pill frames marriage in a very negative light. And that is one thing that Rolo talks a lot about in his book. He kind of states that marriage today is a very bad bet for men and explains a lot of the reasons why. Ruslan calls him out because he is a Christian making these statements like, mm-hmm. dude, what are you doing mm-hmm. here? So that's the context. Well, also, Ruslan's saying, because Rolo claims that he's just giving data. Yeah. And Ruslan's like, wait, hold on. You're missing a bunch of this data that you should have to counterbalance the data that you're presenting yeah. in the rational mail. Because if you're just giving out data, then it, it's one-sided. You need to expand very, the gamut. It's very – like he gives out the the big picture data like, hey, divorces happen like 50% of the time. Yes. Women are initiating like 80% of those. Like men get screwed in the divorce courts. Like why are you doing that or why would he even sign up for that? Right. Whereas Ruslan points out that if you look – sorry, phone call. Um, Ruslan points out it's more nuanced. Like if you look at mm-hmm. – yes, right. Well, we'll actually let him explain it. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's going yeah, back yeah. to the 80-20 rule and the, and the Pareto distribution. Because the marriages that do work, there's a reason why they work. You're right. Yeah. And is to be in a marriage, mm-hmm. okay? So for kids, you mean? For, it, for kids. For its mental health. And okay. again, and I got the studies. We can look at the mm-hmm. studies if you want to look at the studies. Mm-hmm. Suicide rate, depression, unhealth, all kinds of different things. Mm-hmm. Di- hard to, it's mm-hmm. awful if you're a man in your 40s. Mm-hmm. So the Red Pill is framing marriage as this caricature mm-hmm. that maybe on the contractual side, there are outliers mm-hmm. where, women, where women take advantage of men. Mm-hmm. But the average case is that if you know how to make money, mm-hmm. if you understand some of the game side of things, I would mm-hmm. say there's some utility. And I think what you guys do a good job is you, is you stir people away from some type of women that are, in my opinion, selection bias. Mm-hmm. Sauce, you got married before. Right? Briefly, yes. Yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, what did you do to protect yourself in that marriage? Oh, I had a prenup. You had a prenup, mm-hmm. right? 
Dave Ramsey recommends prenups for anybody that's independently wealthy before they go into yeah, marriage. I Dave had Ramsey money, is a financial she didn't, Correct. You got a prenup, yeah. and, and I protected you. Yes. Correct. I got buddies that have covenantal marriages per your book. Got mm-hmm. a couple buddies. They got married. They kept the state out of it. Mm-hmm. They protected themselves. Mm-hmm. Right. And so on and so forth. So I think primarily this this character of marriage, man, is 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 I think very toxic. Mm-hmm. On top of which, you 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 go on to glorify how being a virgin is ideal in a marriage. Mm-hmm. Which is for the woman, for both people, we for could, the we man could, too. For the man, we could correlate yes, body counts. You could. Hold you on. Could. What? You could. Yes, we could correlate, show, we could correlate <laughs> body counts. I'm gonna. This is we where could, I'm gonna start weighing here, gentlemen. <clears throat> we could correlate body counts to yeah. less happiness in a sex life. The, the higher, more partners you have, the less likely you are to be happy in a marriage sexually. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's mm-hmm. proven. I think you. If you don't know what you're you missing, you if ignorance is bliss. Hundred percent. So and on top of wow. and this is the part I'm probably most bummed about, and and you identify as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, somebody. I'm bummed, Rolo, that you left out all the statistics about how unlikely you are to get divorced if you are a person of faith who mm-hmm. practices their faith. Now, I know you're going to say that's the mm-hmm. no true Scotsman argument. It's mm-hmm. not. If you believe in earning wealth, you're going to do certain things to practice earning wealth. If you believe mm-hmm. the Lakers are the best basketball team, you're going to wear a jersey and go to a game occasionally. If you profess to be a Catholic or a Christian, you do things that show that and that mm-hmm. you go to church you pray, you do certain things. So when we factor all of these different variables together, when we factor in, hey, if you make more than an average person, mm-hmm. hey, if you have a great sex life, if you if you maybe have a prenup, if you have independent wealth, mm-hmm. if you're a person of faith, the divorce rate plummets way, way, way off the ground, lower body count. And that's the part roller that I'm like, man, this is such a caricature of marriage that I was really bummed mm-hmm. out that you as a Christian mm-hmm. didn't put any of this in there with the caveat. Mm-hmm. And I appreciated you putting a virgin thing in there because mm-hmm. I thought that was fair of you. Mm-hmm. And that's the part where I go, man, if the optimal environment for our buddy sauce is to one day get married to have kids, okay. why would we not tell him that? Why would we keep this information with, mm-hmm. from him? Why would? So Rolo talks about majority. Then that's mainly where this is coming from because most of the marriages do fail. And that's what he's focusing on culturally today is this is why most marriages fail. This is why it's not a good idea. Ruslan's like, wait, this is, it's important to talk about the small, like the bringing in the 80-20 Pareto <clears throat> distribution. These small amounts of marriages that do are very successful. This is why they're very successful. And he also brings up like, if you're a man of faith, you go to basketball game, basically saying that like, you need to be someone who's actually putting in the, 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 you don't, you, you're a real believer pretty yeah. much. Like you're not just one of these other people that claim it. And um, see, there's a big issue there because like when I take Rolo's, where he's his stance is like his shelter is I have uh, giving you the data I'm giving you the stats and I brought this up last discussion his book is old that book is from 2000 I believe 2002 so a lot of times with books like we brought up the Encyclopedia Britannica if you read that same book uh, Encyclopedia say about like Africa and its main uh, exports and stuff like that in the 1960s it's going to be different than it is today Okay, so you can't read and have those uh, those stats reflect a current situation. I think the so, stats he's referring to, though, divorces and the cause of them are accurate. To right, now. but he's not. Uh, but he's not worse. reconciling yeah. some. Just, but he's not reconciling some of the other ones, which is important for somebody to, who's reading the book to say, well, what do I want? Well, he's, you know, if he's, I want he's focusing on the majority because he's helping people decide the if they want to marry or not. Mm-hmm. So if they're going to want to marry, what are they going to marry well, for? It's important for him to, to, to. He's also, but he needs to know that if I mean, it's just a balancing thing. You know, like if you're painting a picture from one perspective, you have to have the other perspective as well. And that's where Rolo is that guy. He's like, I'm just giving you all the stats where I see Ruslan saying, well, you missed out on those stats. You need to be able to reconcile those in your book. They're minority Because stats. The, They're the men small. who are, well, the men doesn't matter because you're trying to decide if you want to get married. The men who are reading that book after reading that book are going to be like Rolo and say, I don't want to get married because those stats, no matter how marginal they are, haven't been included because if you want to get married, right? Say you just have that desire. I want to get married. And you read Rolo's book. It's not going to seem like there's any glimmering hope for you. Really, it doesn't seem that way. Well, it's, but it's not, if the book included, the- but if the book included some of those stats, you might be saying, "Well, how can I reposition my focus so that I can understand what makes those marriages, the ones that that actually work, work?" Because those are what those young men are in. <clears throat> They're in that situation. Am I going to get married? Should I get married? Should I buy in a mo- monogamous uh, relationship? How should I uh, sort of work this out? Yeah. in current times and that's where it's like well you're kind of the bias in Rolo's uh, stats end up painting that picture it's like you don't want to get married and, you know and, and every, well, you he, know. he proves a point I mean like you're going to have a lot of trouble finding a quality wife 
or a quality male if you are female to go out and get married and that's just the that's just the way it is so it is kind of we're the ones in the really in small minority on what we're yeah. like looking for and what we'd even consider marrying anyway so we're kind of like outside those stats right in the first so place it is and it most is of the men reading that book would be too encouraging for most just the of fact that they sought out rollo's red pill book hmm. that yeah. means that they're giving it some thought you know in a different way you know, you know, those are probably the more thoughtful individuals about marriage. You know, so, so most of the guys who are just following their heart, quote unquote, they're going to find the girl that they like if they just like they're going to fall prey, like Rolo said, to these Disney, <clears throat> you know, ideas and fantasies of marriage. And they're going to most likely end in divorce if they're not giving that the proper care. Um, so that's where I do see Ruslan holding him to the flame and like, you know, you are a man of stats. So if you Ruslan, are a man of stats, share them all. Share them all. Yeah. yeah. So even well, and I think part stats, of the problem, yeah. too, is they... Like, the whole community, the red pill, like Myron always says it too, like, they don't deal in shoulds. They deal in, like, what's now? What's reality now? How do we deal with reality now? They don't deal yeah. with this is how it should be. Right. Well, you when know, I think you can... It's not idealistic. You can deal... You yeah. got... I feel like it's valid to give it an opinion of how... What's better, though, rather than, like, it's debauchery and chaos now, so let's just feed into it. Mm-hmm. Fight fire with fire. And right. it's like... Well, mm-hmm. I mean, there's some marginal stats that aren't worth sharing. Like, mm-hmm. say, for instance, uh, I can we draw up a hypothetical, like, concerning marriage. Like, which states get married the most, you know, or what age groups? Like, that you can sort of take or leave. But there are marginal stats that I would want to hear about in the effect of positive outcome because he's focusing on the negative yeah, yeah. outcome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so sure. if you want to take more of a binary stance on marriage, especially since we know it worked, and he's like, this is the bedrock of the most powerful nation in the world, this is very important to understand that it did work at one point in time. To, to have that balancing feature within you. That's what, that's, the, that's what I love about scientists, though. And Rolo does try and take a scientific report, report, uh, approach is the non-bias involved within the description of what they're finding you know, or have found in the past. So if you see a mutation in a bird or a frog, you know, you're going to say, well, did it help it or did it not help it? Okay, what environmental factors gave and yielded that bad my, my mutation? And then say, how do we bring it back to, you know, the frog that was able to swim through the lake and, and catch its bugs and live a good life rather than the frog with a third leg growing out of its back that can barely, you know, function is going to get eaten by the bird the next day. Right. So the same thing with marriage. It's like, well, now marriage is that frog with a third leg hanging out of its back. Or you can no one take, wants that. You could take like the bodybuilding or, or like diets. Like most people are obese or like critically sort of in a bad spot health wise in this country. Why would we talk about, I mean, it's just the majority is not a great way to gauge what quality is. It never has been, you know, I don't think it's some, one of the ways to, to, I mean, it's important to remember and to take into account, but I mean, if you're going to go and try and progress, really push the buck, Mm -hmm. then you're not going to be gauging yourself against what, you know, the majority. Well, like we talked about, um, the sexual revolution, right? You get this, uh, sort of sexual revolution. And when you, when you, tie up these timelines together and you you draw them out you see that there is when sex is treated frivolously um, relationship begins to suffer then relationship begins to suffer and then families you know there's this there's this chain of consequences that follow Mm -hmm. right and i feel like the when i read these these uh i haven't read rollo but i understand some of his points he says if you have less sex partners you're going to have a better marriage you're going to have uh, so he does bring up that kind of stuff for sure I mean what I was trying to, to really point out by saying that is that uh, most people are already conditioned to see relationship by virtue of how much evolution we've went through cultural evolution we've went through since the 1960s to see sex and relationship on a very diminished value scale you know whereas it takes and that's where I guess we can go to our next point where he talks about the, the effort marriage takes I don't know if that is an expert. And I do wish that Ruslan would have shared those stats. And that's a, that's a lesson for us all. If you have, and it, us, sometimes as believers, we, we like to listen, obviously. But if you have something powerful in your back pocket, take it out. Use it. Doesn't mean you have to sit on it. Like He you know, does, actually. And Ruslan. He does. Forward. He does. Does he? Yeah, yeah. He, he, does he, he share all the stats? He shares he's like, a bunch I have of them. the stats and you no, should he hear it. He shares a bunch of them. He right. tells you why. It's primarily like a certain income where and of course a belief factor but there's a certain income to where if you're not making a bu- uh, enough I think it's 60,000 if you're not making enough and 50 above. or 60 yeah. yeah if you're above like 100k then you, the marriages work out um and if you're not then they usually fall into divorce yeah. but that was my point if you do have a if you're having a debate with somebody and they are 
very good at citing stats and you have stats, recite them. Mm -hmm. Don't just sit there and say, I have them. Say what they are. Well, and that's kind of the fallacy too. Like if, like they're all worried about alimony, child support, all these financial burdens on men in divorce, which are true. But if at those income levels, the divorce rates half, like mm. something, that, you know, like the lower income rates, like that's not where the real problem is. And Russell brought up a good point too. Where would you don't be? have to be married to to pay child support. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know alimony I mean? is different than child support. Yeah, alimony is bringing child support in. Yeah, I had no I idea. Alimony no, I'm just saying I, I learned that. I yeah. didn't know there was a difference. Yeah. Let's see what the, uh, let's see this next. One. To, and I say, Adam, man, I want to double my income this year. Mm-hmm. You're going to give me a bunch of countercultural examples of how to do that, correct? Countercultural? Don't go out and party every night. Don't, gotcha. don't play video games. Don't take on student don't loan debt. Student don't just loan do the debt. typical nine to five. All the of whole that thing. is yeah. col- countercultural. The very fact that you're an influencer <laughs> disqualifies any of that. The very fact that you're on, that you make, do you make more money as a rapper or do you make more money as an influencer right now? Right now as a YouTuber. Then you're following culture. Okay, but, but even I'm as a rapper, culture. you are. No, no, no. no. So, but but I'm explain building that. Why is that? Well, I'm saying culture. that the, our idea of what it is what we want to do, our passions in life, and everything, everything is like I, I, I rail against social co- uh, constructionism. I get that mm-hmm. part of it, right? But the very fact that we're even on this show with all these cameras around mm-hmm. us, or, P, or Patrick's over are you here saying doing that this, he'd be more countercultural. Well, if he said, if he was, "I don't do social media," if he was media. counterculture, he'd be in a punk band. No, 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 no. no. Know? I said, I said <laughs> the things that it requires to be successful at anything is countercultural. Rolo. And so as a person that's creative, I have to make mm-hmm. countercultural decisions to be not the average. But you have to work to within that culture. I do, do have to, I do have to do that. But mm-hmm. let me give you an example. You mentioned something in your book about Christians mm-hmm. jacking culture, mm-hmm. right? And you talked about, uh, uh, what was the striper band and, and oh, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, right? it's, it's, uh, it's the Christian kosher. Christian kosher. I like mm-hmm. that. I like that a lot. But you made this one really this example, and I think this kind of kind of speaks to this. You reference yeah, J.R.R. Uh, R. Tolkien and mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings influencing mm-hmm. Dungeons and da- Dragons. Mm-hmm. And then you also reference C.S. Lewis's Lewis is Chronicles of Narnia, which is sure. to you a spinoff. J.R.R. Tolkien led C.S. Lewis to faith. Mm-hmm. J.R.R. Tolkien built, who's a Christian, mm-hmm. built Lord of the Rings and led culture that mm-hmm. then the world, Dungeons and Dragons and non-Christians followed. Mm-hmm. So I think, I think you miss how much I think is driven by art creativity mm-hmm. within modern music, within you know Lord of the Rings and mm-hmm. all these sorts of things. That your example was often that, like that, mm-hmm. like like that was led by a Christian who led C.S. Lewis, and he was building culture. And I'm saying there's mm-hmm. other examples of people doing that mm-hmm. all throughout history. We could talk about modern pop it's music, modern uh, rock and roll. All of that is rooted in the black. Okay, so that one I pulled up mainly to help some of the younger guys because when we're defending a, a point or we're defending an opinion, we have to realize that our opinions are sometimes, um, they're an opinion, so they're not fact, okay? And so you're de- you're debating somebody and they have another opinion and they could be, that's why politicians are so incredibly good with words. So you could be right and they could be wrong, but if they make a persuasive argument and they sort of cut your head off, then they'll make you even think you're wrong. They gaslight um, you. They gaslight you. So like I was looking at this and I saw, how he's like, do you how would do you make more money on your social platforms than your music? And he's like, you could tell he consented to that. Ruslan consented to that, and at that point, he had sort of postured himself in the in the in the uh, debate as to saying, well, you're playing the same game that you're critiquing. You're a part of culture, which I it shut Ruslan down, and I was kind of frustrated to see that. But Ruslan did perk up, and he's like, well, here's what I'm doing. You know, I'm being we're trying to enter into culture because you saw his I forget the middle guy. He's like, you got a uh, you know, sort of live outside of culture, be and he's like being a punk band, and we see elements of that in our Christian contemporaries, like with the Amish and the Mennonites, right? They live apart from the world. There's several passages in the New Testament that that ask us to be different from the world, be p- pilgrims in this world, um, but that doesn't mean that we're not supposed to be having an outstretched arm to those who are lost and fallen. We're trying to to bring them back in. Um, and so a lot of the, the Amish and the, the Mennonites would be like, well, we're attracting them with our way of life. But you do need to co-mingle, I believe. That's my, especially when I look at Jesus's life and the way he did it. Mm-hmm. He hung out with the prostitutes and the tax collectors. But my point there was to, when you enter into a debate with somebody and you feel like your head got cut off by something, to realize where your uh, opponent's va- position is too. Because Rolo says that he's not, an, uh, he doesn't give what he calls prescriptions. Uh, meaning like edifying advice on a topic because he doesn't want to cause bias or, or relieve himself of his opinions. bias selection. Opinions, right. When then, in fact, he is that influencer. So Ro- Ruslan could have said, well, that's exactly why you're on this this show. Mm-hmm. You have books. 
and he sort of could have leveled the playing field off. But he did go to the point of saying, well, look what you can do with art, social constructivism, meaning like writing books and uh, music. You can, in turn, uh, influence culture in a positive way. But uh, I, did, I did see well, that. And I wanted to, to encourage the young guys because I've, I've had that issue a ton of times. Sometimes you're talking to a teacher and you know they're the teacher at the head of the classroom and they want to be right in front of the students, even though you're right. You know, and you got to stand up for yourself and be like, you know what? I'm going to say what I need to say. I think it comes back down, like we had said a couple of times, like the ideal is not going to be what the majority does. So if you're comparing yourself, I said this earlier on, like um, to what the common um, the majority or is and you're trying to do something that's extraordinary, then good luck with that. You know, mm -hmm. so you statistics could, are always yeah. going to lead you in that that place because you're going to get a bunch of average mm -hmm. numbers. Mm -hmm. And if you want to excel from that, then you're going to have to obviously be on the farther end of the scale. Mm -hmm. You have to work harder to be heard. You're going to have to work way harder to be heard. A lot of times you're also going to have, have to pay attention to the other outliers and what are they doing? And they're usually not living a typical average life in whatever arena that they're trying to succeed in, whether that's marriage or business or or art or whatever whatever you're trying mm -hmm. to do. So I think it's kind of one of those things. He uses culture, but I think what he's trying to say by that is like the average majority, you know, and what do they do and right. that idea. And Rolo just presenting the average majority within his data and him saying – it, being idealistic within okay i want extraordinary or i want some more of these these um these outliers that are doing things great you know which they do exist so we should be yeah and stoked being, on and I'll, I'll just under underline the fact that if you are an outlier and it doesn't to be an outlier it just might mean you're a person of belief among a lot of people who don't believe pilgrim um a pilgrim or some you know in a classroom full of atheists or people who have a progressive mentality you're going to have to work a lot harder for your ideas to be heard because it's just going to sound stupid a lot of times on the surface. Whereas you express that idea among your peers and people who agree with you, you can say a few words and they'll already begin to understand your meaning. Whereas it takes practice. Yeah, you have to be able to not lose hope in your description and, and continue to explain it to the point where they get it. Otherwise, they're going to write you off. Or so take your time. You don't, have to, you don't always get capture someone's understanding. Sometimes people are going to purposely be obtuse and there's no way you can get through to them but what you can do is gauge your own your own what you're presenting yourself so make make your argument or make your whatever you're presenting use the right words you use the right punctuation like take your time with what you're saying and say what you mean when you do say it and then if they get it they get it if they don't they don't but at least yeah. take your time Work with it. Hard. Don't be rushed. Yeah. You know, take your time with those types of moments. You know, don't. It's like John saying, it takes practice because it's, it's scary. But mm -hmm. uh, once you get to it, it's actually it's it's a good. It turns you into a man. Yeah. I think it's good to be able to steal man your opponent's arguments mm -hmm. too. That's absolutely steel right. Steel man. Yeah. As opposed to the straw man. Yeah. Yeah. Which is yeah, that's stuff. I think Jordan Peterson, him and Sam Harris had to steel man each other's arguments. So that just shows you that you have the empathy to know where they're coming from know their argument that they're coming at you with in advance pretty mm -hmm. much. And, and that, that causes a lot. That takes the research. That takes mm -hmm. loving well, somebody. Well, you see that same thing play out in this discussion when uh, Rolo is, is paying uh, a compliment to Ruslan. He's like, you know, I just had this interview with this lady. I forget her name. Jedediah. Jedediah. And he's like, she would watch a clip and from there go on to critique everything. And he's like, you read these books. And, you know, that's a peer-to-peer -peer respect and a courtesy that you have to have. Well, that's when somebody's written a book, world, but when in the somebody's, influencer world, it's not. When like, somebody's written you know, a book, they've clearly garbage. put a lot of work into what's went on in their mind, in their thinking. So it's not something that can be absorbed in 15, mm -hmm. 20 minutes. So, yeah, that's good stuff. Steel man your opponent's argument. And if anything, you disagree, but you'll also have mutual respect. Mm -hmm. Which is win. That's a win. Love people. Get to know <clears> them. <throat> understand them. What they believe before you start cramming and fog drawing your ideas about down someone's mm -hmm. throat. Next clip here. What is it? All the downstream effects Red that could come from it, because you have this romantic ideal in your head that, oh, she's the one. And most guys live mm -hmm. in a state of sexual scarcity. Yeah. So the first girl that that gets off with him, suddenly she's the you know ordained from god to be his wife right. for forever now, now this is this is oh, what uh, final yeah. thoughts because mm -hmm. we have like 20 more topics right. so okay. we're not yeah. going to spend an hour on yeah, marriage yeah. guys so so uh do you think there's any selection bias though in the way you're describing some of these women and in, in terms of the culture 
I don't necessarily think it's a, well, first of all, I think there's a, if there's a bias, it's a post-sexual revolution bias for the last four generations but to for where we're at. For some women, not all women. I would say that uh, in, in some effects, all women and some effects, some women. Okay. So I, I made this point with Jedediah yesterday is like, if you were born after say like 1960 You're right feminist. now, you have had gynocentric feminist sure. ideals planted into your brain that you think are just like give it like given truths you think yeah, that right. they're they're self-evident truths whereas if you were born in a generation prior to the sexual revolution you it would be like you're like what are you what are you talking right, that's about that's fair so, and, so and where is the sexual uh, revolution what's the uh, it's about 1965 yeah 1965 right, right, right when hormonal birth, hormonal control, birth control was was all presented. That kind of stuff. Yeah. So, hippies woodstock that yeah. kind of mm -hmm. was all in that time frame. so Boom. so Go so ahead. you you may prescribe marriage with with some reforms i appreciate you saying that well i did say that monogamy was the bedrock of western yeah, civilization and we agree on that. Absol yeah, how yeah, that is formalized <laughs> is really kind sure. of particular to the society the religion mm -hmm. the guy sure and so i i would take the stance that w i want to tip the scales as much in sauce's favor as i possibly can okay. if he wants so to get we're going to get you married right. sauce yeah, 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 i appreciate no. it i mean what, <laughs> do you do by my side he wants like to have he wants to have kids so that's all yeah. so 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 you say so that's great now your, what I would call your prescriptions, mm -hmm. I think, are where it gets problematic, and you probably know where I'm going. You got, you got, you got spinning plates, mm -hmm. right? And then you have yeah, uh, don't wait for sex if this if she makes. Sure. So this was the genuine desire conversation we huh. had last time. That's a tough one, very um, tough. So Rolo, um, yeah. So to the context on that is Rolo has, this is where he has prescriptions. I would say, and his prescription to combat the current dating market, essentially, which the problems are women have an extreme amount of options today because of the internet, and that creates them to kind of be more flaky and super selective. So he says to basically spin plates, essentially date multiple, you be dating multiple kind of all the time, so you always have options because they're going to just disappear on you. He also points out in the beginning that a lot of guys get so little attention. Once again, the 80-20 rule mm -hmm. of Credo. Most guys aren't getting a whole bunch of attention from women, and when they finally do find just latch a, onto one. <laughs> a one that gives them any kind of attention, doesn't they yeah they latch right on whether they're good for them or not so and that's that one itis like the whole first chapter is on one itis and yeah, that problem one itis and i think rollo's trying to get guys to learn by spinning plates because he's not essentially he's not really saying go out and have <laughs> sex with each one of these plates <laughs> he's saying um go experience women date learn about what you like and what you don't like where it gets off the rails is where it's like you know you're having sex with all these people and then you're, you're causing yourself trouble. But a lot of the guys do need to understand that the first one's the one-itis is a real, it's a real you thing. You know, I, I, I think what he's coming up against is the the amazing force of love itself. And love, love we know is a mature emotion that encompasses so much of what humans do. It's in many ways the epitome, the king word of all vernac of all words. So we as young men think we know what it means, but we don't. And so when you have an infatuation or you're, you're totally raptured by a woman because of, uh, you know, a small gesture of her, her, her being accepting of who you are, these things can take hold of a man's mind in a way that that nothing else can. And well, it you can, said it something can destroy, interesting. You said a gesture of accepting who you are. It, well, they, it could they, just be something positive, and they are interpreting it as they're accepting this woman's accepting them for who they are. When been, that woman doesn't know anything about, there's them. been studies about that actually. Precisely that, uh, I forget his name. I think it's David Buss, but uh, he he does very deep study on how women and men perceive attraction, what their desires are in a mate, and it's exactly what you said. They had a study test. done with two two different groups, um, confederates of male and female. And the uh, males, they were watching a clip, so at the end the woman would smile at the male after they'd had this little communication go down. And they asked each confederate group of male and female what they thought was she was communicating with that smile. Uh -huh. I think it was 80% of males were like, she likes, was, me. she likes me. <laughs> but more than she likes me, it was like she, she likes, she wants to be with me. Oh, so uh, that too far, way too far. And the females were all said the exact. She's just being nice, just being nice to him. Very nice. And he's creeping. 
So men have this um, issue that they need to learn to get through when perceiving body language from a woman, when also understanding themselves and their bio, uh, their bio, their biological reaction to acceptance for a woman, and then and then desiring it. Because the what's the phrase that you actually use? Genuine desire, yeah. genuine desire. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a really tough phrase to understand for a young man. What is genuine desire when I find the woman? Because monogamy in and of itself as a word has a, a singularity to it. It's one woman. Uh, so it's really rough. I think about it as having your heart broken. When you have your heart broken once, you you something inside of you, there's a hesitation that's created inside of you because you, you went you all the way up, bro. Right. You learn, it's like almost but like if you're going to go out and buy a car. How do you teach that is what I'm saying. Well, I don't know how like, you teach you, you that. You learn, you learn that. So I think like, a lot I of... Could take, you could take like buying cars like... If you really need a set of wheels, bro, like you know, a bicycle is gonna work for you. It's better than 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 your than your shoes. You know what I mean? Or if if your barefoot shoes work better, right? So like that's kind of where a lot of guys are at. Like they just want some wheels, bro. They don't even care if it's got an engine in it. Well, that's what I was gonna say. Most guys are so deprived of like any female attention today. That's that's where it goes. Will take any sign right. as, a, as positive. a positive, right? And then, mm-hmm. like, then it comes to the point, so like, so you can get a set of wheels, awesome. Like, okay, so what kind of car do you get? And then you're like, oh, I'm just, I just want, you know, a, a Mercedes Benz. And then you grab that thing, and you're like, man, this thing costs a lot to keep up, man. This car, I'm like, just hemorrhaging money. I just want like a reliable car that I can get into and not spend, you know, ten grand a year doing maintenance, right? So you learn what you want and what is good for you after you kind of get in the market a little bit, but you do have to, I mean, you can learn from other people's experience. Like I can learn from my brothers. I can learn from you. You know, you can learn that, but it takes a lot of that empirical experience when you're dealing with the emotions, like John was saying within, you know, how to gauge what a smile means to you, you know, or what those gestures mean to you hormonally, you know, like what's Mm -hmm. going on. Are you taking this thing on like, you know, super duper? Are you kind of like, you know, have a governor on that on the stuff. genuine desire thing. What he says here, I think we cut it off too soon. Hmm. That he uh, that people get mad about is he specifically lays out in the book on like if the woman is not gonna like if she's withholding sex from you, she's doing that because she doesn't have genuine desire. The where, sex is not worth the wait. Yeah, the sex is not worth the wait. Obviously, he he clarifies like if you have Christian morals on that, this is a different situation. But from the secular point of view, I think. I mean, that makes sense because he always points out like if a girl like a girl will have these rules for some guy and then no no rules for another guy. So it's like where how do you decipher that if you're doing it the Christian way, though? Oh, yeah. Well, then you're spending time getting to know them and it's not about the sex. So it's not about, oh, she's not she's banging some other guy while you're just waiting around to get sloppy, whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, because that's what Rolo's talking about. He's like, if you're not that guy, there's someone else that is that guy. So are you, mm-hmm. are you prepared to deal with that? As a Christian, that's a totally different ball game. You know what I mean? Like you're not you're not in it to just you know get laid. You were trying to find a wife. Mm-hmm. I think at the I think at the real core for a man who's trying to decide on if he wants to marry or not, regardless of if he's uh, you know a Christian, is what are you bringing to the table? If you're going to get mm-hmm. married with somebody, you have to be bringing something to the table. Yeah, you know, merchants are used to this. So if they're trading or they're actually buying some kind of a commodity, they know the worth of the commodity they're buying. They know what other people are willing to pay for it. You know, a lot of times I see younger guys. Um, I've met one guy in particular. Like he, he has really, really high uh, sort of standards. standards. Yeah, and I'm like, and he's, you know unfortunately got wrapped up with the whole almost like mail order bride stuff where he's like going to Colombia, Russia, different places like that because he wants to uh, get that really, really beautiful woman. Super and, um, <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm like, you know, a lot of it has to do, it's like you you couldn't pull that here. You know, like when you bring her here, what do you think is going to happen in a lot of ways? Pawn change. Um, you have to be reflective, ref- self, you have to a self-examine yourself and say, what am I bringing to a marriage? What am I bringing to a relationship? Because if you're just hungry for sex, as most point. men are, you're point. not going to have a productive marriage. Your marriage isn't going to work. Because and that's what that's where up that's where your value. That's if you're a merchant trading in commodities, you're going to be look safe, safe for pearls, and you're just looking for the shape of the pearl. Uh, they could just give you a fake pearl because you're not looking for the uh, sentience or any of the other things, the other values for for judging a pearl for if it's a, a real pearl or not. And so you're going to get into a relationship based on sex. 
So that's why I was like, true, genuine desire for a man is much different for a woman. And that's why the young men get into these traps, you know, where they're not being honest with themselves. And it really has to do with developing a character and something worthwhile to give back to a wife. And that's why even if you did score the girl of your dreams and you weren't prepared for it, you could ruin it. And you could lose that woman because you're not prepared for handling her correctly. You're not prepared to be the man in that relationship. Say, for instance, you did, you know, and you dropped the ball with caring for her, being self-absorbed, not knowing her needs as a woman. Take your pick, man. There's a bunch of them. And she loves you and puts up with your crap for two years, but you don't grow. Then she's going to leave you. You know, and, and it's not to say that those relationships when you're young and you have, you know, high school loves and they get married and they stay together for the rest of their lives. Interestingly enough, those people, when I've seen them, they're very sensitive to each other's needs. And they were even in the beginning. So they had a certain uh, sensitivity about the opposite sex that wasn't just sex, you know. So um, genuine desire is different for, I think, a male and a female. Good point. out with them and i got the quote right here hang with mm -hmm. them on uh is that a quote from the bible that, that by is, no this is this oh, okay. is the, the bible of rollo <laughs> <laughs> savior, savior, savior weekends for women who've been a had proven an interest in you mm -hmm. sexual mm -hmm. uh and and relegate those who haven't to tuesdays and wednesdays mm -hmm. and then you say don't wait don't ever wait for sex if a woman makes you uh mm -hmm. wait for sex i don't now, say now, that is not what that says yeah, by the way i don't say is, I, okay it's the here's the here's the rule okay iron rule of tomasi number three is this if it, if a woman makes you wait for sex the sex is never worth the wait that and i was explaining this to jedediah yesterday mm -hmm. okay this is the number one thing if she people wants try to, to come screw at you me. she'll screw you she'll, well, she'll, she'll not, show okay, that she wants to it's screw you it's not about the sex at, you also say if you look at the end of that chapter mm -hmm. i also make the the i, I put some caveat at the end of that where I'm saying like look if your religious convictions are such that you're like I don't I don't believe in premarital sex because most guys who are reading this most guys on planet earth right now mm -hmm. they're not waiting to have sex most women are not waiting to have sex I am writing for an well not for but I'm writing mm -hmm. in a time mm -hmm. where that is the reality right now also it's not to say that everybody is like that there are guys who are going to wait for sex there are women who are going to mm -hmm. wait for sex got it understood that's why I put the, the caveat at the end of that saying like if this is your conviction Mm -hmm. This chapter, this rule, whatever, is not about the sex part. It is about mm -hmm. establishing genuine desire because that entire uh, rule is all about um, is this is this one really into me? Well, is she I, confusing? I like, I like genuine does she have, does she have mitigating that's, that's what I want to know. Gentlemen, hold on. Do you believe – I want to get your answer and then we're going to move on to the next topic. I promise mm -hmm. you that. Um, do you believe in you should only have sex with one woman and wait till marriage? Yes. That's your belief. Yes. Okay. And, and based on the empirical data, virgins okay. are happiest in marriage. People who wait to get married okay. are the happiest. People with the lowest body counts are the most fulfilled. So, because so, so my ignorance issue, is bliss. So my so, issue, sure. But my issue is when we're saying, when Rollo with one sentence is saying, I'm a Christian and mm -hmm. being a virgin is great, mm -hmm. so, you know, and 70% of virgins mm -hmm. are in church. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we're creating a, an environment based on the, like, increasing women's body counts and increasing mm -hmm. men's body counts, which is going to be counterintuitive because to when they want to settle down and get married. That, you're reading that as a prescription, okay? But how, that, is that, how is spinning plates okay. not a prescription, well, okay. Rollo? I'll, I'll tell you. But just so I'm clear, do you believe in the, uh, what he believes in? So we kind of covered we did, that yeah. topic. Yeah, I, I did have one point that I'd like to uh, say about that. It just came to me as I was watching it again. He saw, talks about the circumstances that we're in today, and he also gives way to them, kind of like his argument against Ruslan saying, are you a part of culture? Because spinning plates is the exact reason why the, the notion of marriage has been so far degraded. The more people can spin plates, it's kind of like having a lot of channels to pick from too. You know, it's like how many women... When I was dating, there's a lot of women I could see myself with and if I was to like try and put that into some uh, metric calculator, I wouldn't even be able to answer it myself. Some of them are really beautiful and smart. Some of them had careers. Some of them didn't, but they wanted children. You know, there was always some kind of you know something that made them. They all seemed sure sort of evenly matched almost mm -hmm. it's in some ways. But um, Rolo should know that the elements within society that create the arsenal that is hurting marriage are well known to us all. You know, it's not having respect for the opposite sex or yourself and having too many, you know, we know what they are. 
And so I wish that that, because in effect, Rollo's book is not just describing circumstance of this age in marriage. It should also be, it's apparent after reading his books, the factors that accumulated to hurt marriage so much. And sometimes within his prescriptions, I oh, see he playing. does talk about that. Yeah, well, I, I see, book I'm not saying was... that I'm saying in this discussion here because I haven't read his book, brother. Yeah, so I you don't should because he does talk about it. That's why they begin the conversation with 1965, the uh, gynocentric um, move. He, he really does go like, this is why. He, he, he does tell you why. Uh, but I don't think it's just like he said. So why he, play into it? Well, he said something earlier. And, uh, he was like, um, Western civilization was founded on on monogamous monogamy but like that comment say it one time for me please. monogamous relationships yeah. like western or like this country what was the basically bedrock is the monogamous relationship mm -hmm. the, the bedrock, bedrock of, of this country. country right that just got blindly looked over by everybody it, like no one it didn't trigger anybody no well, one was like oh wow dude, dude you, like you, you just could, you just actually issue, said something brother. very profound. you can tell like, by you told us that this <sighs> is the whole reason rollo why. does this that, is the way that it rollo is. Hold on, John. he does it on purpose hold on bro so like it, what I'm what I'm pointing out is that a lot of those kind of comments they don't get paid the attention that they deserve. That's by Rolo's people. fault, dude. That's no one else's but Rolo's fault. He'll say that in an offhand way, just the way his caveats were at the end of the chapter, probably in about three or four, maybe a paragraph. The end of he the does that on purpose. When, when he in. when he it's wants to elaborate, to Rolo is very good at elaborating on the points he thinks will get attention. He will drop those bombs like that and allow them to fall flat. If he wanted to elaborate on monog monogamy is the bedrock of this country, he would have, but he doesn't. I still that's the I still, issue I, still I take. Think with it's him. interesting how people would rather not pay attention to that because when he said that, I perked up to it. I was like, yeah. That sounds like something I want to pay attention. Well, they, they have this kind of like mm. you're never going to go backwards viewpoint. It's right. like this: we're, we've arrived here, it's a mess, and this is the mess we're going to deal with. It's never going to go back. Right. And it's kind of like a it's cynical. It, it's a cynical view, yeah. and you know they have the reasons for it, and that's why they're you know dealing with what should you know they always say I don't deal in what should be, I just deal in what is, and so their advice is for what is now. Which I think is kind it's of kind silly. Of nihilistic, dude. It's nihilistic, and it's like, okay, society is seventy percent overweight. Do we deal with what is on that, or do we deal with what should? Exactly. Like, right. That's why I brought this it is, up. This earlier. is my critique it's of like, Rolo, and it has to do with the way he's serving up the information. Because you can discover his biases on what he wants to focus on, on what he's giving the most of his breath to. Because if he knows that, he could wax long on that. He can say, "Hold on, everybody, let's think about." Western society, the bedrock of Western society, what caused this development? He could steer the conversation. He's obviously the biggest brain in the room. He could steer it where he wants to. And therein lies where his biases are. We can exhume his biases from where his attention is, like Joe brings up uh, Ian McGilchrist. Where your attention, where you direct it, where you give it is a moral uh, choice. Choice, right. So while he can say he has no bias or prescriptions, we can tell where he his desire is in the form of his speech and how long he takes his time on certain content. So let's be serious with that. The next one is on Andrew Tate. Right. So uh, he cites kings and sultans of always having multiple women. Oh, We've heard his opinion on that. We can play even a video on that. Oh, yeah. uh, and in one interview, he said that his father doesn't, that the father doesn't need to be around their children, that it's the mother's job to look after their kids, and that he saw his dad once a month and when he's younger. But the point is, this guy's everywhere right now. We have actually have a, an exchange, if you want to play that TikTok video, Natalia, and we'll let you guys get weigh in on <laughs> Andrew Tate um, and everything he talks about these days. Let's see this video. God, this guy, man. Audio. Remember, we're attacking ideas, not... Yeah, yeah. not a person. But I want to attack the person, Mike. <laughs> then you're feeding right into this. <laughs> this I just need to understand this. I understand that. Honest. But in a relationship, Correct. it's a partnership. Yes. Right. You and me, we're together. Since when? I love hope. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> when, you're, when you're trying to build a partnership and a life with someone, <laughs> yeah. the end goal is no you two together. Agreed. So why cheat? I know. I understand where you're coming from. My point is that relationships and life is full of double standards as a whole. A man's going to pay for everything everywhere you go, right? This is, this is, do, is a man. Do you agree? No, I do like traditional. Okay, so you agree. So you're traditional, right? So if you want to talk about Shopping traditional, let's talk about tradition. Every Shopping single man since the dawn of human time had more than one woman. 
every single king, every single emperor, every single sultan, every single conqueror since the dawn of human time had more than every one woman. All of them. Man. Every single one. Read a history book. Read the Bible. You it's all high value the man. Quran, all of it. You want to talk about tradition, it's all there. The only reason your mind is different, the only reason you believe differently is because the society, society has come along and told you so. Yeah, but society, we can change. Like, the world evolves, things change. The world evolves, yeah, that's right. Now, now, now men can't cut their dicks off and their chicks. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Um, Rolo, you know, you know Tate very well. So I, I, but, did, I did a full video during the break. All right. <laughs> now, there's some truth in what he says there. Because what, obviously, the, he's making arguments for multiple women. That's a whole different thing. I don't even know if it's worth talking about. But the, the argument, I think, it is valid is men... Our role in the relationship has been stagnant or like provider. static. Yeah, we are the provider, protect. Like what women want out of men has like never changed. Now women have changed, mm. and so they they still want the old school traditional male, but they're like they're not at all it. traditional female at mm-hmm. all. Yeah, they want it. So that's the big argument you, that and they talk it. about. Yeah, and <clears throat> I, I see that. We all see that, um, and that's apparent with the people who, uh, gosh, what's the name of them? The liberals, you know, like how they have that outrage for whatever they're outraged about, and then they will endorse looting, right? Or they'll make excuses for their own behavior. That, double standard, that, that's double what he standard, talks about. right? So no, that's exactly right. So, that's so I saying. get it, the double standard, but uh, just the contrived uh, history lesson there is just hard to stomach, man. Well, I brought up. I know you don't care for this, but I do. Um, the the idea is is that saying that just because throughout history men had multiple wives or high value men quote whatever that means which we'll get into later um that they had multiple wives and i'd like to specifically bring up king solomon being the wisest out of all of them and him having a problem with women specifically mm-hmm. women that were outside of uh his they weren't jewish women which i will also say if you have a problem with women you're always going for something different so you're going to end up out there in Weirdville, and he did. And King Solomon, being the wisest guy in the world, I doubt you're going to uh, <laughs> to be able to compete with his intellect. He made that mistake, you know. So I mean, it brought down Israel to its knees, put it in debt, and his kids were screwed. So I mean, yeah, he's the wisest guy in the world. Yes, he had the biggest empire, but in reality, his he didn't have much to leave to his kids, and it wasn't in good shape when he passed. Uh, it was a big big crap shoot so mm. um this happens a lot too it's not just with solomon it happens quite often in life so well i'm just more isn't always better yeah and uh, i'm tired of like when that. again this goes back to that example where ruslan sort of got his head chopped off by rollo by saying oh you're a social influencer mm-hmm. blah 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 same thing happened to that young lady when she was uh she said traditional, old right? fashioned tradition right but she didn't know what she was talking about so she needed to explain it because when you think exactly. about tradition from a, a humanitarian or i don't know if i'm using that word correctly but i guess from like the interview consider the entire history of the, our species what is traditional by a huge margin is uh one wife one one husband monogamous relationship and rollo says that even in feudal japan yeah. um China, anywhere you pick it's biological it's, so that would yeah. be uh more or less a phenomenon among very powerful and rich men which is representing 0.01% of the population. So why invoke that? Those men aren't looking for uh, reasons to have more wives or less wives or doing whatever they want to. Opulence. It's... Again, it's just, and this is another issue. This is where I, I think our job here is to educate young men and say, like, if something's making you feel good, because Andrew Tate makes a specific kind of person feel good. All right, we need to understand this. He makes the man who's been disenfranchised, who's kind of like, uh, you know, licking his wounds from females and is looking for a power position to employ to make his his insecurities sort of take a back seat. And he makes those men feel good. The issue that I take with him is he's not the only way to feel better from that position is to understand women better and yourself. Not to take this power position where you're all of a sudden, uh, you know, that 0.01 percent tile start uh having a relationship with that 0.01 percentile um go five years doing that understand your relationships have suffered way more from that because you are not a part of that and then have a very very messed up idea of monogamy well, he, women and men and but the reason why is like because there are some people who listen to tate and they don't like it well, i'm hold one on. of them. that it's a lot of garbage communication going on number one just straight off the bat so like tate what he does is he gaslights her he starts off by saying guys have to pay for everything um basically like we're doing all this this heavy lifting and then he says 
so do you like the old fashioned pretty much thing? And she says, well, yeah, I like the old fashioned. Basically, totally neglecting the fact that she might like to be a housewife. She might like mm-hmm. to do the ki- the cooking and the cleaning. She might like to do be have the counterbalance to her man paying it, and that could be perfectly fine. But he doesn't ask that question. He assumes and gaslights her on that topic. Did you watch the whole interview? And though? That, well, I'm saying that clip. He yeah, didn't well, ask. That's I'm just the... saying that's the conversation that should have been sued. Like, if you do like old fashioned, well, you do like old fashioned. Well, do you like what? What else do you like about it? Just me paying the stuff, or do you actually like, you know, doing your part? Yeah, Andrew Tate's not you know respectful what I mean? on that. That's way. not really respectful yeah. on it. That's making an assumption on someone's beliefs and then yeah. driving really hard into your side of it. I don't like that kind of communication not at I. all. It's no. an absolute communication where you're not actually taking the other person yeah. into consideration just because you're quicker. It's like Donald Trump, you know, like he, there's a lot of figures in our uh, ethos politically it doesn't matter they're there and they what they'll do is the and this is again this is a formula for distraction that they use when they're in a discussion you know it's like uh let's distract them from the point by either making a joke or sounding extremely certain of something or being self-proclaimed you know uh, he's not a guy who understands history to be able to make these you know absolute expra- expansive gestures on what fundamental things not a fan but but that's not the point is it the point is to know who he's attracting in his audience as young men and understand because our job as iron disciples is to try re-educate and have these young men self-examine so if you like stuff and you're turned on by that ask yourself why that's not stuff that you should be turned on by as far as understanding the woman better or yourself um andrew tate is a figure that's very inflammatory so let's let's take let's i'm not yeah i know you didn't want me to start taking him apart i'm trying not to <clears throat> Once again, it's not about Andrew Tate. It's about that style of conversation yeah. being used. Mm-hmm. That's what I was to be aware about. of this, guys. Like why you like it. When you do get in a conversation with someone like this, what to expect? Because it's like going on a roller coaster sometimes, and you got to put your feet on the ground and you got to know where you at with these type of people. Yeah, they're clever. That's for sure. Very yeah. clever. Yeah. Very. Uh, okay. So, is it about body count? That's the other thing. Okay. I mean, so, here's the thing: is if you read those six chapters, you'll also notice that the end of that, of all the sixth chapter, is transitioning from have to eat more high uh, nutrient, mm-hmm. high volume mm-hmm. food, mm-hmm. get my protein, get my macros mm-hmm. due to compound lives. I don't understand why this isn't directly transferable, this philosophy mm-hmm. transferable to yeah, ending right. up in a high marriage. So you're like, mm-hmm. most men are going to uh, sleep around and do whatever. And I'm mm-hmm. like, yeah, and most people are fat, bro. you know, mm-hmm. 70%. More than that, 75. Yeah, 30 or mm-hmm. well, 40% are obese. Mm-hmm. Most people are like most people. I understand, mm-hmm. right? But what I'm saying is if we're leading men and I'm and we're saying, hey, Sauce, how do we get more money? And you're like, dude, this is what you got to do. You got to work on this. Hey, how do you, man, you've been married 26 years. How did you guys do that? Somebody asked me. We went to marriage conferences. We read a ton of books. We educated ourselves. We got premarital counseling. We had the hard conversations. We. That was nice. I think, uh, yeah, we paused it there. Um, That's a good place to pause. Yeah. It's yeah. good. Cool. Did you want to talk about that? I think it's so. Oh, yeah. Um, so Rolo, a big one of his big points is the 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 fairy tale marriage, the Walt the, the Disney style love affair, and um, people's expectations going into a marriage or even a relationship. Now, this happens in all kinds of walks of life. Whether you want to be like a professional basketball player, a musician, you know, or or get married to a woman, we have these we have these very imbalanced expectations of what to expect. They're fantasies. They're fantasies. They're dreams. They're the silver lining. It's not the work. It's not the diligence. It's not the real meat and potatoes and nuts and bolts and the gears, right? It's not that. So what he's, what Rolo really wants, wants to destroy, if you will, is the idea that it's all, you know, roses when you get married. He's like, no, actually it just becomes, you, you start to actually know what loving somebody is. That That's commitment. That's hard work. That's putting in the due diligence. Now, Rosalind, Rosalind um, points out his marriage and why it was successful. And he's like, before we got married, we did we did all this front end work, we, counseling, we did, reading right. books. You know, they put the work. They put the work. In. They, they didn't think that they were just gonna feel good and have no. this endless dopamine hormone roller coaster for the rest of their lives. They used that dopamine, those hormones, to study together. To make the most out of yeah. what you should do, which is why those hormones are there in the first place, because they're there so that you can build a foundation, put the extra effort into that so that you can have longevity in the form. But most people just spend that time partying, hanging out, going on vacation, doing a lot of very 
um, uh, shallow stuff. Um, I mean, it's not bad to go on vacation, have a honeymoon, do that kind of stuff. Sure, go do that. It's enjoy your time with your wife or your future mate. However, you know, you got to put the hard work in to build a foundation to your house, to your castle that you're going to build it on. And I know? think that's the really the message of the red pill too is to unplugging from the matrix of what the fairy tale relationship or marriage is and then just coming to, to reality mm. leaving the matrix mm. and realizing what what it is All right no True. filet mignons bro you're getting like some yeah mm -hmm. but at least it's real well a lot of young people they go through this um, because they have a relationship you know it's really fun and then it turns into the work part mm -hmm. and then this person's not the one for me so let's go find another person you have that honeymoon phase everything's really exciting you're all telling because it really what it is is you're telling all your best stories yeah you're telling all your best stories you guys are sharing you're in a heightened point of like dopamine and all kinds of drugs that your body's giving you oh yeah and then you go to this point of of reality of like sort of the the dark side of who you are the 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 what carl jung describes the shadow elements of your character i don't know if it's that and, bad but well it's just... absolutely that and i know that from being with a person uh, regardless of their sex is when you meet somebody for the first time the the excitement is something that holds you there and i think that that's a good thing but when the shadow sides the parts of your 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 psyche that you're not sharing on purpose, not like you share a story on purpose. You know that by when you've hung out with somebody for five or six months and then they start to flake on you. True colors, or they, dude. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. So these things are going to make their appearance whether you like it or not. It's not going to be in how interesting your stories are in anything. They actually show up because it's a part of due course of a relationship. So that's why I really liked the reading of books because when you read books written by uh people who have been married for a while, they can tell you how they handled arguments, how they were able to deal with reconciliation. Um, the most important thing within a marriage is to understand and what a lot of the books begin to describe is I've read a couple, I'm going to read several more with my wife. My mom, our mom's been great. She gives us these reading materials, but you're sharing consciousness. And so what consciousness does is it helps, it's like your, um, your, your sense of direction, right? Um, it doesn't just say consciousness means you're, 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 uh, you're, you, what, I'm drawing a blank on the word for, for what gives you, uh, what's right or wrong. Uh, not just your conscience, right? Your conscience. Morality? Principle. Your morale is, it's consciousness and then your conscience, right? Your conscience is going to tell you what's right or wrong. So if you're with a woman that doesn't have a moral or ethical background that can support listening to you while you're describing something that's messed up in your life, um, but she wants to be listened to. Talking about Julia then, and Brave New World? Oh, I mean, 1984? Sort of like that, but more or less, it ends up being that you guys cannot share certain things. And there are some things you can't share with a wife, but there are things that you must, otherwise it won't work out. So I think that that's why some of those, it's you can't really get those lessons from just watching a movie. You can't get those lessons. You have to read the books. You have to go to counseling. People have to be a part of your marital life that care about both of you and know <clears throat> what you guys are about, know some of your struggles, know some of your arguments, and they're able to walk you through that process of holding you against the mirror and say, well, here's where you're wrong or here's where you're not seeing things. And you have to read books for that. You have to go to count. If you have uh, like a therapist, I, I've recently found this out. Like if you have a, they're doing this now in the churches. It makes a lot more sense to me where they have a married couple sit there with you instead of just one therapist who sort of empathizes with one more than the other. And it makes more sense because when you sit there with a married couple, they they are going to have more of a balance with how they interact and you also get to see them do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's frequently happening in churches is now where they're, go they're doing, I'm going to start doing it with Pastor Jim and his wife, Sandra, and I'm looking forward to it. Because I do, we have to believe that our brothers and sisters who've walked through these things have something to give us. And uh, if you care about your marriage m enough, then you're going to read the books and you're going to do the counseling because you care about your wife or you care about yourself, you care about your future kids. Um, people go to college for four years to do a job, right? So um, it just stands to reason to do those things and be encouraged that if your marriage isn't working out and you haven't tried those things, why don't you try them? Yeah, be the yeah. best version of yourself. Yeah. And that's where you got to start with yourself. Yeah, so many and, couples, they start to fight, and they're just like, this isn't working out. And it's like, well, what have you actually done to try? Have you have you tried reading books together? Have you tried counseling? 
you mm-hmm. know, and it's sad that most of the time people try those things when they're five, six years into a relationship and a lot of bad habits have taken root with communication and they, there's more work to do. So on the front end, why not do it? Well, a lot of people who get into relationships, not, they should probably get counseling before they go That's into That's what one. I was saying in the front yeah. end, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because like what, what was that article? I think I sent it to you where it talked about relationship. Oh yeah. It looked at, um, it took a large pool of people basically got all their demographic information to see if there's any correlations mm. on uh, relationship success. And there was basically none. Um, as far as we're talking things from like height, career, all these different like objective things. And they said the the main things that did predict were questions like, were you basically, hmm. how, it was pretty much the condition of the person going into the relationship. Wow. And um, then what kind of like mental condition? Yeah, like were they happy with their life yeah. or are they depressed or not? Like stuff like their own mental condition hmm. going into it. That makes a lot it. of sense, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, he said that they were they were happy alone for the Let's men. Get you closer to the mic. It was mostly for men. I remember yeah. you said it. It was for men because I thought about as I asked you, I was like, "What about for women? Do you think it's the same for women?" You were like, "I don't think so because they probably need a lot of times a provider in like the um, typical traditional, traditional relationship." And I think men, men, men can ride solo, like they could do life solo a lot easier. I think. Just look at My Fair Lady, man. That movie cracks me I up love every that movie. time, man. Amazing. Uh, for those who haven't watched it, it's about a man who's very well off. You know, he's he's passionate about his career, and he takes a bet with somebody to see if he can tune this this uh, sort Turn of street to a lady. woman into a lady. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, man, I encourage anybody to watch that movie. You get a lot of lessons in that one. Yeah, there's a great sign Fine piece of cinema. Oh man, let a woman into your life, dude. That ba- song. Ba- 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 you let a woman into your life. You know, he goes through. <laughs> it's just the most brutal. Uh, and then you know he's got to eat his words because he he meets a very different side of it. And that's why I think counseling is so important because me as a man, when I get in an argument with my wife, I see my side of it and I can struggle and I can pine and I can suffer to see her side but sometimes it does you just don't understand mm-hmm. that perspective and you need it I know that my mom's helped me understand my wife tons of times you know and it's some sometimes very simple little reorganizing of perspective and that I don't I couldn't do myself yeah it's tough so, yep it one thing tough. I like about the red pill community though they heavily promote men to first be the best version of themselves before they even deal with women mm-hmm. yeah like they talk about money muscles game and frame is kind of like the things like get your career your money your finances in order um get to the gym be fit um yeah and you know get understand women basically Mm -hmm. that's the the game side understand yourself and then women and then frame is just like Mm -hmm. holding your ground kind of in your with your masculinity and your masculine frame in the relationship congruent with who you are basically like if you if you are this person, then it's then like if you're not even person. if you can't like have that, like you you got to work on yourself before mm-hmm. even. That's working great. On that, it's a chain of consequences to success. Mm-hmm. First things first. Um, what's that passage in Matthew? Is it or not Matthew? I said Matthew because I'm reading it. Uh, Timothy, I think, or Titus, where Paul talks about the widows, and he's like, you treat widows or older women as mothers, and then uh, any other woman as sisters. Mm-hmm. And I thought about that for a while, and it's one of those condensed statements that you can just read over, you know, really quickly. But treating a woman like a sister means you're going to learn a lot about them. Like with my sister, I have learned a lot from her. I've done a lot for her. And, well, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to trust, after, though. I mean, I've like, tried to be a good brother. You, <laughs> you know? got to trust a woman. To <laughs> but be a lot a of the times with men, we look at women as potential partners, and it's a very hard thing to help. So it's a very hard thing to help. But when he's, Paul says it, we're supposed to look at them as sisters initially. And even with my, you know, some of my female relationships, like my mom and my, my wife, I can see how I'm handling them like a sister still because you have a care that's transcendent of the sexual dynamic, you know, and that causes you to be more of a man because you're actually caring about her uh, needs from a different perspective because game is confusing you know and I think that a lot of young men have that I need to get my game up I need to be attractive in my you know whatever I'm missing if it's humor I'm missing that I'm not telling stories right or I don't know how to present myself whatever the game element that they need to work on and I feel like the Bible does a really good job by being a brother because some of 
being a sister, be looking at them like sisters rather than potential mates mm. can help take some of the anxiety away. You know, like I'm going to do my best for this person, regardless of their sexual mate or a potential wife. And it helps to simplify the sort of the anxieties and the emotional output that you might have, you know, because that helped me a lot. You know, when you start to think about a woman as a potential mate, everything changes, man. Yeah, you know, good luck though help. telling some young guy that's, that's with an attractive girl like, oh, you're not going to think of her in that way. But it's it's a weird thought because it's not that everything goes out the window. I mean, if she's your wife, you're still going to end up treating her like a sister sometimes. It doesn't have to be absolutes, but yeah, I yeah. think it's just the idea that she's a human being. That's right, her because it helps. A sexual object. Yeah, it helps to simplify you know. your, your emotions, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I think Paul knew what he was talking about. <laughs> um, I had a clip I had marked, mm -hmm. but if you got any other ones, we're at the edge of the other the stuff we had already covered. I think we're missing one. This later. is uh, so this is on what accountability. <laughs> this is a, oh, this will lead into the okay, yeah, a little passing. bit of a roast on women. Uh, Props to my dad. I love my dad now. We're good. Uh, and I got to see some of his perspective on the other. But what about like when men are hypergamous? What about when men mm -hmm. abandon women? Because I've, I've seen that. That's I've seen the, that. That is mm -hmm. the only narrative you hear. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely that's the fair. only that's narrative fair. you hear is the deadbeat dad. Like, for instance, mm -hmm. like we, we, in fact, we, especially every Father's Day, we, it's not Father's Day anymore. It's Special Person's Day right now. It, it, which, the, which, which that's nonsense. But every, but yeah. every, you can, you, <laughs> can, get, thing, you really? can get this in, in every church yeah. sermon. If you look at the difference between Mother's Day sermons and Father's Day, sermons mother's day is oh you're doing you're doing great girl you we love you so much you're doing you're doing the job of t you know 10 men yeah. and they don't you don't need no, and no man you're doing you're just as good a father as you are a, as a mother when father's day rolls around the sermon is do better well, look, just me, do better because you're you're not living up to your expectations that it's constantly like that. Let me, but isn't that a more masculine way to like get men She's to right. react you that's why they're not in the, that's like, why they're not in the church right what, what do you what would you tell a natalia that's why he says a lot of men aren't in church right now, which is probably kind of true. Mm -hmm. But well, you know, uh, I remember when you were in the sauna with me, you're like, men like a drill sergeant. You know, yeah. it's, it's true. Men like that, but at the same time, it needs to be balanced out. <laughs> you need to have some. Yeah, and say, I think hey, that's good job, buddy. That's the yeah. that is a true statement, though. Men are absolutely always railed on, always held accountable. They're always like men are always called like the cheaters when we know like the data now is like women are actually cheating more, but really no one's talking that about really? it. Yeah, um, I would say that. Um, yeah, it was like a new article I saw and I think New York Post was women are cheating more than men. Wow. And I think that that data has shown to be the case ex um, for a while now, especially it's pre it's pretty much under 30 women are cheating more over 30 men start to cheat more. And I think that's just for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. Like women have all the leverage under 30 men have all the leverage over 30 it's just kind of biology anyway. So what do they do with the combined number? Do they combine it? Like, uh. Like men from early, from sexual, whatever, like throughout their their span of life, which sex is it? Is it for both sex? Now the women are outpacing men. That's yeah. what it seems that uh, it for the whole. Um, I think it's a really hard one to fully study because who's you're doing surveys? That's who's going to be fully study, honest? Yeah. Um, well, stuff you can like think that. about like social media and like who's getting more DMs. Women. Yeah. Women percent. Yeah, dudes have the higher testosterone. They're gonna well, be the ones here's the thing too that I thought about, guys. Like women are gonna be approaching. This is that. this is not this. Uh, this is just thoughts. You guys weigh in on them. The sexual act isn't as 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 esteemed as it is for 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 men as it is for women, right? So like, let's say you're the woman with the DMs. They got like twenty DMs. They're probably getting off on that more than a man would from penetration, right? Yeah. So, like, that's something to consider, you know, because that's taking up just as much real estate in your mind. Well, I think that's where, Probably like, more. Uh, but, uh, sex is for men is attention is for women. Like, yeah, if be, women are, post, are, getting, are posting stuff for attention in that way, and especially if you're in a relationship with them, that's cheating in my opinion. filling view. that void. It's the like, same damn thing. Sorry, man. You know, what's, yeah, what's the, what's the goal out of each gender kind of in right. that topic? Yeah. Because and, men uh, will obviously want men, sex. Yeah. Women can get by with attention in many cases. Yeah. yeah. And that might be just, I, I'd imagine, better for them mm -hmm. than sex. You know, I, I think that their uh, pleasure centers would probably be more, you know, easily stimulated, less of that, I mean, all the other stuff. Like, why, why would they even want to have sex? It's funny because, you know, the literature involved 
the women read read about they they actually read their pornography, mm-hmm. whereas men they watch it. You know, it's different. Um, so I think that that's another really important clue because when you say, well, which ones cheat more? It's like that's the action of sex with the penetration thing and all that, right? Whereas like a woman would say, I don't cheat, but I have, like Joe was saying, a million in their DMs and they're dressing promiscuous. They're dreaming about dreaming it. Dreaming about it, right? Fantasizing hard about it, you know, and having a, a completely perverted sense of sex as a result. So, I mean, yeah. It's yeah. hard to compare apples to oranges. I know that's what I'm doing right now, but, that but we are apples and oranges. You know, there's women and men. So I think I think it's true though. Men are definitely held way more accountable by society than women. They kind of just get away with whatever the heck they want. I wonder, in the world, yeah. yeah, it's sad because the last thing I remember talking about on the podcast we did before this one was the war and battle that Christian men are in to preserve and cultivate definition and words to help young men understand what they're talking about and that we can preserve ideas by virtue of standing up for the words because the words are the brick and mortar of the ideas that they create and this being a, of essential work to the older men to teach the younger men. And so uh, the words that we're talking about becomes like, you know, uh, genuine desire, um, courtship, marriage, uh, defining terms in a way that we can teach them to, like also the self-examination where you talk about Andrew Tate um, throwing around words that are absolutes and, and just gaslighting. gaslighting. We need to have that battle on our forefront so that people can't take words from us. You know, that's what Satan started with a lie, and a lie is a perversion No on one has words. to hurry you up in conversation. You can say, whoa, hold on. That's right. You can, you can stop it. Mm-hmm. and take a moment and think. And if they don't allow that or they're threatened by that, there's a problem. Or if somebody, you're talking like what it's happened to problem. Ruslan and uh, Rolo, it's like culture, and then Ruslan's, or Rolo's like social constructivism. Uh, social constructivism. Well, he kind of, how do you say it? Put himself uh, into that one because he was I know, I know, but to it's, build culture and like they were really talking about majority. The terminology on that conversation was not super yeah, I, watertight. That's why dude. I was bringing it up because I, you brought that up, yeah. and I thought you were right, Joe. You're like, that's you're kind of like shoving it in there, you know? No, we're talking about majority <clears throat> conclusions and what, like he said, what most people do. Like, yeah, because the Bible says, "I am the Word." God says he he did he created with the Word. You know, the power of the Word is, oh my gosh, it cannot be understated. But it is being understated, and we understate the word every time we allow somebody to sabotage a definition, and then that goes unchecked, and then from there the idea begins to crumble, and before you know it, we're in some real dire straits because communication breakdown means mm-hmm. war, and when you have war, you have no one talking on either side. Yeah. That's not good. No, and that's we're at war for ideas. And that's divorce. That is divorce. That is what divorce is. Yeah. So it's, it's the end. So- I got a question for you guys, kind of on a topic I've been th- or thinking about within this Christian dating community. Some of the problems posed is, um, so we know pretty much scientifically that a relationship, it's like two years where it's like that dopamine phase that where a lot of them break off after that ends. Christians get married in like a year. <laughs> so you're going, you're, you're deciding a lifelong decision when you're in the dopamine stage. Mm-hmm. And there's really no way around it, because mm-hmm. it's like, oh, you get, and if you, especially if you want to do it morally right, it's a, it's it's like a paradox. I think we need to talk about the third person in the room, which is God, yeah. Jesus. So would that work in a uh, secular circumstance? I would say probably less. Mm-hmm. If both of them believe and love the Lord and have an active relationship that constitutes reading the Bible together, praying together, reading the literature, having fellowship with others, I would say it would work very well. Well, because clearly you have it, the third, it does, right? Think, you, have the, the, you have the the person, God, yeah. the third person in the room. Whereas secularly, you don't have that check; uh, those checks in account the Bible. You don't have that there. Yeah. So it's just my word against yours, and then who's going to win? And gosh, well, if you look know. at the the whole the idea of why there would be all these hormones involved to begin with, hmm. the idea is is that you meet somebody you have a child, you procreate, and to get you through those rough times where the wife is literally pregnant and you have to take care of her, you have these extra hormones to help you do that and vice versa. It's the only way you're going to get through primitive man having a baby. It's just the only way it's going to happen. So like this we have to deal with 
in the, <clears throat> in, the, in, the in, in the in current times, modern times. Obviously, we don't fighting for survival. Like, there's plenty of food. We live in a we live in a modern world. So we go out and party. We go out and, and basically just have fun. When you know, we should be putting the due diligence into the relationship and putting that this, that that foundationary you know groundwork down, which is what you should be doing. But that's the reason why we have all these hormones is so we could survive back in the day with a child. Because mm-hmm. usually, we we were just we were having babies as soon as there was attraction. I think so yeah. that's the way it went. You found someone you liked, you had a baby with them, and then you had to raise that baby. And that happened in the span of a few months. And that's when you were in the honeymoon phase. And by the time the two years that you're saying is up, usually it was like the father was like everyone was kind of able to to, to kind of get on the kids walking around. You know, it's it's, it's a little. Well, I bit think more it was able. frowned upon to be a serial dater. I mean, now we all know it's it's a great drug to be in love but it's not being in love really it's just having somebody accept you of the opposite sex and generally feel good about that mm-hmm. and i've known tons of young people who they date for three months the hard work started starts coming up they don't have a kid obviously they've just been having sex and going places that's nice and then that runs out and they meet somebody new and they want to perpetuate that wonderful twitter patient um and they end up doing themselves serious harm so i know that yeah. when you talk about those um those just endorphins or whatever they are, that cocktail of incredible brain chemicals you get, that is, uh, it's addictive, um, and it's, but it's not a defining factor of what well, love the reality is. is, is like, unless you're very successful on a bunch of money and you don't really care about whether the girl has good character or not, you just want hot chicks to bang, you can live that lifestyle. Um, it's not going to be very fulfilling in the long term, and you might have a bunch of kids that you end up paying alimony for, some crazy, 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 insane women that you have to get restraining word orders on and put in jail, which does happen quite often. I've heard stories about this just last night. Very successful man have these problems, guys, um, with very beautiful women. Um, so if you're going down that road, or if you're not going down that road, and say you just want like a beautiful woman with a good character, that's the needle in the haystack, number one. You're not gonna be able to serial that type of strategy. It's not gonna happen. You're not gonna serial date multiple good character, beautiful women. They just don't well, exist. Well, it's not even, it won't be the goal for any Christian man anyway. No. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm so like, it just doesn't make sense. Well, I mean, like, in the end. he was anyway, bringing up- you kind of cut it, you know, to kind of go live in that. that I think the, the, the answer to the question is, because when you're looking at it from a secular standpoint, it seems uh, brazen and sort of lacking thoughtfulness. Let's get married in three months or a year. And they're they're looking at the Christian couple and saying, well, you should have figured each other out. You're still on that Twitter-pated, heightened, you know, cocktail of love chemical phase. Why not wait that out? And then when that's done, you'll be able to see the real version of that person. And that's probably what you'd hear. But they're forgetting the third person in the mm-hmm. room, right? So that's where there's an ex- extreme difference between the way that we as believers look at a relationship and the way we're accountable to God rather than somebody who's secular. And it's like, well, what's the newest article on how men and women should should uh, interact? How I do I like tell you're out. right and how do I tell I'm right or who's being listened to the most? You don't know how many times couples deal with that. They're like, well, I was talking for a while. Oh, I've been listening. You know, you hear this. It's like, well, who's going to say? You know, maybe maybe it's the wife who's been listened to the most, or maybe it's the husband who's you don't know. That's why if you it, that's why a lot of those ma- marriages fail is because the accountability function only works if you have a foundation of moral and ethical structure that you can both relate to. It doesn't work if you don't, because then it's just an opinion. You it's know? equally yoked. Well, and um, but there's I like to point out the way people meet. Like, um, if you lived in the same town and like a lot of old, like back in the day they would be like, oh, you know, little Jilly would really work well for little Edward, mm. you know? And, like, these were older parents. They had matchmakers a lot of times. Like, the Jews use this quite a bit, and a lot of cultures use this, where it wasn't these two adolescents choosing each other so much as it was, like, the people that understood them, these elderly people that had, they were, like, matching them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, like, within <clears throat> the dating apps and all this stuff, there's not the, the, the people don't know how they learn by making mistakes. They don't understand. They don't have that third like John's talking about third person in the room. Well, like you have family, you have like a lot of things. That's why people are like, hey, like let do you want to come meet my family? Like um, if you're serious about somebody or you want to, because you, you you trust your family to be like, do you like this person? You know, and and, and you know they're gonna embarrass you, and you know that, that it's gonna be awkward. And then you're also looking at the person like how they're gonna handle my family, how they're gonna handle these like these odd moments, and um, 
that that's that's a big way like you know you can't just meet somebody that you're see, like you have to take all that into account especially if you're if you're young right that's now. don't just always, hit the dating apps yeah. and expect to meet somebody and go off on your own i was like no excited. one's telling the truth no one's being yeah. honest it's very hard to find that's people facades that are, you know it's yeah everyone's putting on yeah. a giant facade dude. you know I, I was always excited when i was in my dating years when somebody knew somebody or they knew their family like there was some some legit background that they could be like this person i know him and I'd be like, wow, that's the, I'm excited for that because when you meet somebody out of the e- the the internet, <laughs> you don't have that, and you're definitely going to see a facade. And no man can judge another man. I mean, this just or another Unless woman, you're my mother, in which case. And even no. then, you know, it's rough. But it, I was always really excited by that. Like I always wanted to have. Never happened. Never. Well, did I have in the same town like, for a long time? Generally, yeah, or somebody. Community. Yeah, there we, has we did not to be have that growing circumstances up. that give that. You know. Um, that opportunity to arise, but I always was excited by it. I was always like, "Well, you know what? That that that's something to bet on, right there." It's like a present, yeah. you know. Someone knows you; they give you good right. presents. But you know, again, that red top, the red pill, um, uh, preaching point to say, work on yourself as an individual before you go into design or even thinking you deserve a relationship. Well, and then spinning plates I think that's too. What like a lot that's, of, a, that's how he's telling them to learn about women. And that's where I kind of am like, that's where I talk about Paul saying, learn about. Teaching, if you can treat them properly as a sister, and you and hold your mind to that, even around attractive women, without sexualizing them, then you're starting to turn into a man. Then you're starting to know what a man is like. Then you're starting to know how to treat a woman, and they're gonna your interactions will be cultivated to the point where you can treat a wife the way a wife needs to be. Uh, so when you're young. Uh, you don't want that. Let's be honest. <laughs> no one. That's that's the nasty homework that you just don't want to get into. But that un- that fortunately will make you uh, a better provider and and a love a loving partner. I don't know if that's necessarily true because like when I was young and I thought about my wife, like I thought about all kinds of stuff I wanted to do for her. Like it was like I thought about making a family, like the small interactions we would have. Like it was a whole lot more than just like oh I want to plow this beautiful woman every time I come home from work. When you were younger, like because I had those thoughts, like I had those thoughts weirdly enough, and I want to know if it's the same way for you. When I was like up until around like sixth grade i had it from like being i think you didn't have the five. <laughs> yeah as soon as those hormones kicked on it was like sex yeah yeah for me um but i did have those thoughts well it was, I, was I was like i think for a lot of guys it's like you do have the sex but then again you're also like you do want you do want the wife you know so it's like you are contending against those thoughts and sure it's like brutal but at the same time you're like but was I it like that for you like, when you were younger it was more romantic when you were younger. Yeah, me too. It's I weird. mean, when I get older, yeah, of course, your your hormones kick on, mm-hmm. yeah. change the landscape a lot. Yeah, but I, I think that that's a great thing. And uh, you know, if you're young and you don't have uh, an idea of what you want to do or any special interests, and all you want is a wife, and you think that's going to fix all your problems, maybe you should problems. take it. Will add problems. <laughs> take a step back and just take take a step back for a second. There, you know, it's not because you don't have a wife that you're not happy. You know, don't try to find a wife if you're not happy. Don't make her the reason for your happiness. That's a it's not that's fair a, to that's her. Definitely gonna fail. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Christ should be your source of happiness and yeah. joy. Yeah, and it should I, be hers too. We're married to Christ first, you know. And um, one point that I did have written, and I didn't get a chance to talk about this last time, but I guess I'll bring it up now. Um, I was getting told a lot in the beginning of my relationship to treat my wife the way Christ treated the church. And this created um, sort of a bias towards Christ's mercy, long suffering, all of those things that we see in Christ's um, his example um, that we were like, th- that are hard for us men. You know, sit down, listen, show care, show patience and gentleness, you know, kindness. Um, but I didn't hear much of like, if we're going to be honest with that and say, what did Christ do for the church? What is his role playing for the church? Now, he admonishes, he corrects, he rebukes. And how does that look in in the um, in the church, contemporary church sermon? I don't hear about that. It's like Rollo said, it's all like the Mother's Day. Yeah, I want to hear more uh, of that. I want to hear more of how that's done. Imbalanced. You know, I've asked some of my my uh, mentors about that, and they not much was there. And I was like, well, how do you rebuke and uh, can't hold your, uh, what was it? So it's rebuke, um, uh, admonish. Those two 
how do we do that as a husband? And it usually was like, well, through kindness. And I was like, well, sure, you say it kindly. Sure, you say it with love. But how does that take its form? And it's it's a bit of a rough one. You could tell people are stumbling through, and even I was. You know, I'm like, and I still am. That's why I'm bringing it up to you guys. Like, what do you guys think? You know, about how that looks in in a, in a marriage. You know, because we are the ones who are the providers. You know, we are the head of the household. That's what we are asked to do. We are also supposed to self-sacrifice on behalf of our mates. Um, so what, what then, you know, when the correction and the admonishment and the rebuke happen, you know, I, I know that I just heard some women talk about that on a podcast where the, the girl was calling out women in general, like we are terrible at receiving, like if our husband or boyfriend is upset with us and brings it to our attention, what we did wrong, we then flip it on them, get mad. Like we're literally mad because they made us feel bad and then we get mad at them. And that just is a very common thing among, yeah. cause she was even like, if my girlfriend brought that up, if my girlfriend brought that up to me, she's like, I wouldn't do that to her. Like I'd respect, I'd probably respect what she just told me. Whereas if it's from your husband or boyfriend, mm-hmm. we as mm-hmm. women don't behave well in that case. Gross, yeah. So she was calling on women on that. Like, Obviously, I don't know. What... I think it's true. And I, I mean, like, uh, that's where I see some of that bias in Christ's character as the husband of the church and the leader of the church, where it's like, yeah, you know, when Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, when he was talking to Peter, he wasn't calling Peter out. He was just saying, like, here's what's going on. You know, you're being used by Satan right now. Um, he wasn't like, oh, you're such a bad disciple or such a bad apostle. Um, so we can carry out things in, in love and kindness and patience. Let's get you close to the microphone. Oh, and we can, we can, we can be the, that's where I've been. And I've honestly been thinking a lot about this year with Bible studies. How do you affect admonishment and rebuke? You know, because I've been reticent on those points because I don't want to be too hard or I don't want to be too this or too that or come across. But many times within conflict, it, it ends up, People get pushed further apart so new air can enter into the relationship to come closer together. And that's a process and an exercise we don't have a lot of experience with. It comes down to communication because, like, when you're talking about, like, the one girl, when she's, like, um, she's basically manipulating the conversation to her favor instead of addressing what the honesty that he's trying to bring to her. Because And that's why so many men don't aren't actually honest with their wives. That's right. And then when you have that happen, then your communication comes down even another a lower notch. Now, there's all kinds of things like we saw Tate use gaslighting today. We can see like and women are very good at this because we live in a gynocentric world right now where they get off with a whole lot more than men do. And they have their cake and they can eat it, so to speak, guys, so to speak here. Um, so name calling, that's another one. Like they'll be like, you're so mean when you're saying something truthful, right? And then then it becomes about them and you being mean and being insulting, right? Or they'll bring something completely else up that has nothing to do with or the Or they topic. can just cry. Or they'll cry, right? So, like, these are the type of things that, that are the crying is the worst because it's just, like, impossible to deal with. So, you know, this is— Or they is, can just is, act uncomfortable. Well, like, when know, like Jay Jordan said so, says something sucks. about his, his relationship, he's like, uh, we promised to tell each other the truth. Mm. From the very beginning. And we were really dead set on this. Like, this is important. We're not going to lie to each other. And his wife, they did like a personality test. She's, she's pretty disagreeable. Um, and she's not very polite. So she's more like towards the masculine side of things, you know. Um, Which works for Jordan. Huh? He so he doesn't that. have to, you know, she's going to tell him what's on her, his, her mind. And he, she's going to be able to tell, react pretty honestly, you can tell. From when he does the same to her mm-hmm. and when you're dealing with women and like especially if they're raised up on a lot of drama sitcoms whatever like romance novels you're going to have an indoctrinated type of person with a very imbalanced style of communication true for men these husband. days i mean yeah it's it's messed but that's just and i was at the question to me was for me po- po- posed for you guys was like how how did you see that carried out correctly and if you did see it carried out co- correctly <clears throat> how do you think men can improve on it uh, you have to lay the out. groundwork. You have to have. You have to define so, what so good one communication thing, is with your wife. You have to. You can't use these. You can't use the gaslighting. You can't use the narrative change. You can't use the name calling. You can't use the crying. You can't manipulate things just because you can. You have to try to really find. You know, have some kind so of. So say a man's in a relationship because I mean, no woman's perfect, right? So we have to consent to the woman having a few of these problems and issues, especially if you're marrying in the West. What does he do? 
So I mean, I don't I, have the answer. I, I know, I know. For this, mm-hmm. I have I've learned a couple things with my sister, uh, because and I love my sister. She she knows I love her, but um, we've had an issue where she'd hang up the phone where we would get into conversations that she didn't like for one reason or another and click, <clears throat> it was ended. And for a while, I had this idea that I wouldn't bring it up, you know, what we were, whatever caused that. But then I was like, that's not true. I'm not being honest, like Jordan Peterson said, so I should bring it up and then maybe we should broach that subject under different uh, dynamics, emotional dynamics. Let things cool off a bit. Don't mm. forget the point of the conversation is basically what I learned. And uh, it works if you can bring it up. and Because I think men, what I, I was just trying to recognize the elements within my character that could be tuned up. And what I would understood happening inside of my heart was this person doesn't care. They're never going to care. So that point wouldn't be brought up again. Maybe that now, be this- now I'm like, you know what? I care about the way I feel about what's going on enough to bring it up again until I feel like she's actually listened to me. Kind of loads into what you've been saying throughout the podcast, kind of. hmm. With taking your time within conversation and like, yeah, but but also because with women, I have noticed I can be very direct and have a certain form of uh, men in general. Right, right. We men in general have that more direct way of communicating about things, especially when tensions are high. So I waited, but I did notice that I wasn't I wasn't being honest, and that was a big issue. Like if I if there's only room in the well, you were intimidated, bro, because you thought she would hang up on you again, and then you wouldn't have a conversation, and that's how the one that's that's how that tactic works. It says I will shut the door on you, I will kick you out, I will uh, you know. That's the, that's the same tactic, right? And so I think a lot of men. It's suffer intimidation from that. is what she was using on you. She was intimidating you by the by withholding yeah. communication. But it was from also you. my decision to be intimidated. And so like that's where I would sit there and say, well, if I'm the older brother, I should be able to broach this subject again, letting her know that I care about it. Because I think there was a masculine sense of, uh, like, I'm just not going to mess with that, and I'm fine without it. It's really up to her, right? Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I'm not fine without it. She needs to hear about this. We're going to have a healthy relationship, so we need to, we need to talk about it. There's not only room in this relationship to hear her side of things. Well, you know, the human eye oh. will pass over the things that it does not want to look at. It's, it's proven. Like, it's so if there's a problem, it's called yeah. willful blindness. Yeah. So, like, when you have somebody that's keeping you accountable, that loves you, and that's like, hey, like, this part you're missing right here. Like, let's take a look at this, and it's not because... It's because I love you and I want us to take care of this. You can't have somebody, you you might get some pushback on that. You have to be prepared for that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, you're going to get pushback on that. I had to get, it's going to feel like, thanks, man. Right, right. You know, it might not be that way. uh, Another thing that came to mind was I had to get real with expressing in detail um, because I don't cry very often. If something's hurting me deeply, I'm not going to cry. Usually I'm going to be quiet. And I'm going to go to a place and think or, you know, remove myself. I'm not really the crier. Women respond to that kind of stuff. They see it in kids. When the kid starts to cry, oh, my gosh, you know, they get this very response where they quiet down and they want to get it. Uh, the full view of the situation, men don't have that. So I, un- I understood I had to learn how to say things like this hurts my heart a lot or explain the emotional circumstance that I was ex- going yeah, through. Like, you're a liar. You woman. feel nothing. You're a sociopath. I see no emotional response. <laughs> That's what they see. You know, yeah. th- so um, you have to get good at describing where your heart is in a way that it's Start to a, learn to cry, bro. Just, come on. <laughs> Sometimes it's, that would feel like a lie. You come know, on, for me, just, I just couldn't get do it. Not, I'm not Tom Hanks or some of those great Jordan actors. just cries all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I could turn that on. You know, there's there's preachers, I think, go to class oh, for it. Totally, totally, drama class. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> we as men need to sort of turn it on. Well, you need to be in touch with your emotions and Because what you just said happens for them. You know, like, they're going to see your stoic face describing something, and you're going to say it hurts, but they're not going to be able to connect dots on it, so it's going to feel insincere. Well, I'll tell you something that's interesting. I was reading um, Juice Merlot again, and he was talking about this. This one of his one of his patients, she suffered from like headaches, pretty bad. And um, he, he was like, "Okay, well, why do you have headaches?" We went to the doctor. Everyone's going back with clean reports. Like, it's probably a psychological issue. So he goes into the past trauma. It's like, what's going on? When you were, when did you first get your headaches? Hmm. She's like, "Well, I was a little girl, and I was going to school, and I had a headache, and I told my mom, and I." She she was like, oh, you poor baby, you're not going to school. Oh, she put power. her arms, gave her all this love and affection, and she didn't have to go to school. I mean, it's like a win-win. It's like not only do I have to not go to school, but I get special treatment. So these headaches sound like a good idea. A good idea. <laughs> so like she started 
doing the headache all the time. And then pretty soon, the headaches became real. <laughs> Placebo effect. Became real, bro. What and then the she had to deal said? with these headaches later on in her life, mm-hmm. past, the, past the, the coddling the mother and getting out of school. So this type of thinking does no one any good ever. You know what I mean? It's never going to do you any good being dishonest about these types of things in your life. You're going to end up Jordan Peterson making says, a demon. I have met one person <laughs> who's done evil in their life and didn't have to come and atone for it in one form or another. Mm-hmm. And that's a fact. And it's also a good thing because then you can sit there and, and have to in, entertain uh, anguish and know that at least if you're confronting something because you desire truth, um, whatever the outcome will be better than you know conflict averted is conflict compounded, as he says. And mm-hmm. that's comforting me many times because you're going to face hard times and you're going to have to face times where you need to express yourself and you're going to have to exert yourself in a way that's uncomfortable for everybody. And you need to learn how that feels. And Mostly you need to yourself. Learn how to stick your guns. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you're um, learn that it's okay. It's going to be okay afterwards. Yeah. Keep God at your center point. Yeah. You know, keep God at your center point. He's asked many Amen. of his uh, apostles and prophets, uh, all of them, you know, they were pushing these circumstances of pressure. And we find ourselves there many times. It's where a great gift Yeah, because then you end up using, you end up using the right power. You know, you're not using not arrogance. Yours. You're not using these manly stuff. You're, you're, you're really using the right source mm-hmm. at that point in time. Because the rest of it will, will lead you on yeah. off. You'll become like using the same tactics that like Tate and a lot of these other guys use. And you'll wonder why you're attracted to them because they do work. But that's not the way you want to be because no. at the end of the day, just like that little girl with the headaches, you're going to end up with a big ass demon. What was this for? You guys brought up another word like placebo the other day in our text thread. What was it? No, it's no, placebo. No, placebo. Yeah, was, I'll get into this guy. So really interesting. we were talking about placebo. Remember? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was, and this like for positive things, <clears throat> like so the sugar pill and the blood pressure goes down, whatever. Mm-hmm. So they have I actually have a no I was curious. It's like what if somebody got like a false cancer reading? They're like, You have terminal <clears throat> cancer. Oh, I remember now. You're gonna die. And they they die. And uh, this happens, guys. Mm-hmm. And upon the autopsy, there's no There's nothing wrong with this guy. Why. Like he yeah. didn't have any cancer, bro. And it went back to the witch doctor that Again, told you like, about this is the cursing power, the person power and of the then word. dying. Power of the word. The power of the word, man. power of belief. It's so crazy. Well man. the word the word sustains belief. The, the eyes perceive truths, the ears hear truths, and the words describe them. Okay, so like that's the power of the word, man. It's like d- speaking death over your life. It's not only just the word so from anyone. Life. It has to be from a doctor. It has to be like you have to believe it. It has to be from like this right It's more place. than just a suggestion. That's Yeah, it's not like some bum on the yeah. side. Like, You're going to die one day, boy. Yeah. Even it's that like, stuff no, will stick with you. It's your doctor who knows you just got the test done. And he's like, you're, you're screwed, bro. Yeah, dude, if somebody hears that they're bad at violin from like four or five people they're not going to feel good about that it's going to stick with them it goes back to your headache dude you know know that's why bullies are bullies yeah but anyway that's the idea i think that um satan uses against us all the time you know and so that's why we need to know our word that goes into culture man yeah you don't even need satan around for that you know you just need people well fortunately there's only one dynamic jealousy we only exercise and that is from satan so I mean, there's only one way that it, that we can we can walk through life, and that's with influence from God and influence from Satan. Us standing in the middle, sort of evaluating our choice. So that's all. That's the way it is for every human being that's ever walked this planet. But uh, yeah, anything else you guys want to talk about? Well, I think we're I think we're an hour and forty minutes in. So nice. Mm-hmm. We'll flew by up. today. Yeah, let's do it. We had a good time despite all the other stuff. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's always great yeah. town. Love you guys. Love you too. All right. Everybody want to close in prayer? Uh, you, it's uh, here. I, you want to do it, Mike? Lord, thank you so much for this conversation today, Lord. I thank you that we can bridge these difficult topics and uh, just be willing to make mistakes in these thoughts. Even God, we're here to learn together, grow, and and God, I know you're at the source of our our desires, our discernment, our wisdom, Lord. I just pray that you would bless the audience as they listen to this as well, God, that we would all learn together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.